Okay, lovely. So, uh, very, very good evening to everybody who is uh, joining us for this webinar. Uh, the next hour is going to be extremely insightful and uh, I'm very proud to share that we have uh, two of the industry's leading lights, uh, Mr. Sanjay Fadke and Mr. Shailesh Duri here. Uh, between both of them, they span tremendous years of entrepreneurship, digitization, analytics, technology, finance, um, and it's indeed a pleasure to, to hear from both of them jointly uh, this evening. Uh, so thank you both uh, so very much and a very warm welcome to all our participants. Uh, you know, we have students from the academy, we have students from outside, and we also have some faculty members joining us today. Um, I won't, I won't uh, you know, take too much of your time, but a quick round of introduction. Uh, Mr. Shailesh Duri is the co-founder and CEO of Decimal Point Analytics, which is one of uh, not only India, but one of the uh, leading analytics companies across the world with offices in Mumbai, uh, Nasik, London, and New York. Uh, Mr. Duri has done some very, very exciting things in his life uh, and thinks about analytics in a very, very different way uh, compared to the conventional street um, wisdom. So uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Duri, for joining us today. Uh, it's my pleasure. You're doing, doing well. Uh, Mr. Sanjay Fadke is another industry veteran with several years of experience under his belt. He started off in the financial services um, industry and has moved to technology, analytics, and fintech. Uh, he is a popular author as well now, and he authored the book uh, Fintech Future, Digital DNA of Finance, uh, where the forward was written by one of the deputy governors. It's a fantastic read. Uh, and we've actually sent it across to have several of our students at the academy. Uh, Mr. Fadke is also working on some uh, fantastic new innovations in the healthcare technology space, which he will also talk about today. Um, and he's he's led some transformative businesses, uh, you know, in his career spanning over two decades. So thank you so much, Mr. Fadke, for joining us. Uh, it's indeed a pleasure to have you both, uh, you know, join today. Uh, without further ado, uh, you know, I'd like to open it up to the speakers, uh, you know, a quick uh, run through on the format. Uh, we will first start with, uh, uh, with Mr. With Mr. Dhuri, uh, with, sorry, with Mr. Fadke, who's going to be talking a little bit about fintech and the trajectory in the, in the next few years. We will then move on to Mr. Dhuri, who will talk about data analytics, airships, and a bunch of other interesting things. Uh, after the presentation, we will have a moderated discussion between the speakers and the and, and myself. Um, and the last fifteen minutes of uh, of the webinar will be, uh, you know, towards the speaker Q and A, uh, the audience Q and A. Uh, so the main mode of engagement for the audience will be through the chat box. I am going to be moderating the chat box. So if at any point during the presentation or after you have any questions, please feel free to type them, and I will post them to the speaker towards the end of the session. Uh, so without further ado, uh, Mr. Fadke, over to you. Request you to say a, uh, say a few words about yourself and then carry on with your with your slides. Sure. Thanks, uh, Karan. Uh, can you hear me well uh, before I start? Yes. Yeah, I can hear you well, see you well. Uh, okay. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, uh, hi, hello, Shailesh. And uh, uh, hi, everybody on the line. Uh, I can see 30, 40 people. I think we are expecting many more, but let's start. Let me just give you a brief background about myself. Uh, I've been an engineer and a banker uh, for most of my career, about uh, 20 odd years in uh, mainstream finance with uh, large local firms like JP Morgan, uh, HSBC, as well as uh, local firms like Edelweiss. Uh, and uh, about four years back, I decided to switch to the fintech world and uh, learned, the idea was to learn the technology. Uh, being an engineer, the interest was always more on real things. Uh, uh, so the tech seemed to be really, really interesting. The world was being taken over by technology by that time. And uh, I thought I wanted to make that switch happen. And I continued to uh, relearn where I'd left off from my engineering days back into the tech world in a fintech company that I worked with called Vyana, which is one of the global uh, uh, startups from India in the field of supply chain financing or trade financing technology. Along the way, I also started, uh, as Karan mentioned, uh, on some of the other deeper science initiatives, uh, which are uh, 
going to be useful for the future, especially as we talk about COVID and so on. Uh, they would be probably called deep tech and so on. So if you have time, after I talk about fintech, uh, I'll briefly kind of uh, talk about that. But uh, let me, given a uh, short time, let me start off with uh, my presentation. Uh, so let me just uh, use the share screen. Uh, uh, okay, Karan, I think I am not able to share my screen. Um, okay. Uh, just going to quickly have a look. Sure. So, okay. So while, while that is coming on, uh, so, you know, some of the interesting things uh, that we'll talk about in this uh, uh, hour and a half session, uh, uh, very, very interesting ideas that will come from Shailesh and we'll talk about it together as well. Uh, there is some something very interesting that I'm looking forward to hear about, which is airships. Uh, and uh, if time permits, we'll talk about uh, the health technologies of, uh, of tomorrow. Uh, like uh, the world is becoming, uh, the world of finance is becoming oriented and essentially in some ways being taken over by fintech. Uh, I would think the same thing will happen to the uh, world of health, healthcare, the hospitals, the uh, labs and so on, which will get uh, uh, essentially uh, change to an Amazon uh, of the effectively an Amazon of the retail will come to the uh, digital healthcare space. So uh, that's that's something that we can talk about uh, at the end. Yeah, uh, you, you can now share your screen, Mr. Fatke. We, we just made you the host now. Great. Yeah, I can do that. Yes. So okay. Can you see my screen now? Yeah, I can see it. Okay. Okay, so I actually also wrote a book uh, called Fintech Future, and that uh, was a, a summary of all my uh, learnings and ideas uh, over the period of uh, four years on the technology and 20 years in finance before that. Uh, so this book was uh, done in a virtual release in the Barclays Rice, uh, uh, New York, London, Mumbai. That's why I prepared this presentation. Uh, so uh, I just thought I'll use the same because it has a summary of the book uh, and related topics to today. So essentially in terms of fintech, uh, you know, fintech is about finance, finance is about money and what is really money? Money is really a, a foundational concept. Uh, if, uh, you know, if money wasn't there, the civilization would not have been there to the extent that we see as a developed civilization today. So it is really as important as uh, as language, which is the other uh, huge uh, civilizational uh, kind of a paradigm. Uh, the reason why money is so important is because it allows uh, things which cannot be compared to each other to be traded between them. So think of it like uh, means of exchange between apples and oranges, uh, to use the cliched uh, terminology. Uh, it also establishes certain uh, transaction level trust between strangers. And think of it again from the time that uh, we had uh, people living in caves and how would they lots of, how would they sort of uh, communicate between one, uh, you know, one village with another village when they didn't really have a language, uh, or the language was really rudimentary and they had to exchange, let's say, apples and oranges. So the transaction level trust really came through uh, money in the form of uh, initially uh, uh, any form of uh, physical attributes uh, like cowrie shells, which became uh, which became coins. That coins then became uh, government authorized coins, and then ultimately it became uh, a paper note. All of these are analog forms of money, uh, but essentially by becoming an entry into a bank account or a mobile wallet. Uh, or an app based uh, that we are now used to, that money became digital and it also became virtual. There was one event which uh, accelerated the entire uh, digitization of uh, uh, money or finance, and that was the fall of Bretton Woods. And Bretton Woods really was, uh, was, was an agreement between world powers at the end of the uh, Second World War, where uh, they remade the world and they essentially. Uh, 
uh, created a gold standard. And that gold standard meant that the entire money supply in the world was backed by a certain amount of gold, uh, physical gold. So essentially, one could always replace a note with theoretically a gold from a vault. And Bretton Woods Fall uh, changed all that because money essentially became purely virtual. There was nothing to back. Today, money has nothing to back. A note from RBI or a Federal Reserve, you cannot exchange it with anything except uh, wait uh, or, or, or go to RBI and ask, ask for uh, a payment. So it's really a virtual uh, concept now. What that has meant is that the global uh, liquidity has, uh, uh, which was earlier hinged to the amount of supply of gold, has become unhinged. And eventually it has become unhinged to a very funny and uh, uh, grotesque way. Today, uh, the total money supply in the world has uh, literally reached $85 trillion, uh, which is uh, uh, which is uh, roughly double of what it was uh, uh, 10 years back. So after the financial crisis of 2008, the global financial crisis, the liquidity just kept on becoming bigger. And the corona crisis uh, in the last two uh, months has made the US central bank liquidity to go another uh, uh, double from what it was. So there's just too much money to which is uh, going around now. Uh, but unfortunately, it's too much, but it's too little for most of the people on the earth. So, so that's why the title of the slide, I put it as money is magic because it allowed so many new things, but the magic has kind of gone mad a bit. And can technology help it become better is the question. So uh, when did technology enter money? Right? It really happened after the World War II when we started having semiconductors, the semiconductors uh, became more and more commonplace, faster, uh, and there was a famous law called Moore's Law, which is which has really changed the customer behavior in a in a direct way. Uh, because what was a supercomputer in 1970s or 1980s is really this uh, uh, phone in my hand right now, which uh, uh, which has more power than that. Uh, so that created huge new applications, and those applications uh, were used by the uh, Wall Street, which was the first adopter, uh, and the Main Street, which is uh, kind of the non-market uh, side of finance, followed after that. Uh, but it was still the world of uh, the businesses, which are or rather banks having the best of the technology. But after the 90s, after the, after the dot-com boom, the industrial technology actually started lagging and uh, the consumer technology, uh, again, take the example of the phone or take the example of the wearable, uh, Alexa, or whatever you call, is far, far, far superior than what is used by the uh, uh, industrial uh, technology. So today, FinTech is all, all over, everywhere around us. And it's a part of a wider process, really, where, uh, you know, across industries, starting from retail, media, telecom, uh, finance, which is uh, the next one, where human life essentially is becoming digital uh, one by one. Uh, and it's just, uh, if you look at it in a civilizational concept uh, or context uh, over uh, hundreds or thousands of years, it's, it's really just a process that is probably getting accelerated by COVID, and we'll talk about that a bit. So there are two main players in the world of uh, fintech or finance, right? One is the banks, which are kind of incumbents, and then there are tech companies. Uh, the question is, who will really survive uh, if you look at 5, 10, 15 years? So some of the key things that will uh, matter is that uh, while the Moore's Law is now more or less uh, saturated, so the, the speed of the uh, uh, processor capacities and the size crunching of the processor is not really happening as fast as before, unless there are new new uh, new uh, breakthroughs in the material science because we're still using essentially silicon and we're reaching the limits of the nano uh, 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 nanometers in terms of uh, how how much we can crunch those uh, 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 processors into a small chip. Uh, unless some other some other new material comes, uh, and we are working on a few of them, like carbon, for example. Uh, what will really matter is the speed of telecom. The speed of telecommunications is going to change in a big way going forward. And all of us have heard about 5G and so on. So that's one big change, and that will require a different mindset to utilize that uh, uh, fast processing. And 
that kind of dwarfs the bank DNA. Bank DNA is a slow, conservative, slow, uh, fail, uh, or rather do not fail kind of DNA. Whereas the tech DNA is pretty much uh, fail, fail forward, fail fast, and learn, and do it again, and do it again. So uh, in some way, that's how humans learn as well. So tech DNA is far more, uh, uh, far more, somewhat more intuitive, uh, just that it which typically does not work well for the world of finance, uh, but who knows? The big change will be played by the regulators. The regulators can decide who can become a bank and who cannot, and who can provide a service and who cannot. It was similar. It is a similar case in healthcare as well, as, as to who can become, who, who can set up a hospital is a regulatory uh, body. Education was the same, and if you see all of these industries which were being serviced by large, more sort of big box, are, are increasingly get, getting serviced by uh, by tech players uh, who reach the customer directly. And customer is really the king uh, in, a, in a democratic setup. Uh, so customer will decide really whether it's big bank which will remain or big techs like Amazon, Google, uh, or Facebook, uh, Alibaba, Microsoft will remain or will it be the fintech players who will take their place. Uh, obviously, the big techs are very resourceful. They can make billions of dollars of investment as they're making in India right now. But banks are better off in that sense because of that to collaborate with uh, with fintechs. So if you look at the global fintech ecosystem, there are three main models. One is the American, second is Chinese, and third is the Indian model. The American model uh, worked on technology which was pretty much 1960s, 70s, 80s. So they had the credit cards, they had the... Uh, uh, the credit bureaus, so all of these were developed then and they still continue. Uh, they have robust technology, but uh, very, very slow compared to the emerging markets, or especially China and of late India. The Chinese model essentially is a post-internet model and Chinese technology is uh, is really, really superior in some sense, probably the best in the uh, world of fintech at least. Uh, and they have the advantage of the entire uh, large amounts of data. Uh, which is easily available because it's a community-driven, uh, uh, community-driven nation, uh, a communist nation as well. Uh, the individual privacy is not that critical. What that means is that with the increasing amount of uh, processing capability, uh, when you combine that with the huge amount of data that Chinese can feed into their algorithms, you come up with a very unique model where a credit score of an individual can be based on not just uh, what the US credit score model is, but a behavioral model, uh, what somebody serves, what somebody uh, uses in terms of uh, how somebody eats, uh, how somebody crosses the road, are there traffic violations, all of that can be combined to make a credit uh, score, for example. So it's, it's a very different world. Uh, uh, to some, it will be invasion of privacy as well. The Indian model though, is kind of a middle of the road. It, uh, I would call it sort of tech enabled capitalist, uh, but it's also socialist. So it's a mix of those. Where uh, unlike China, where you know it's really the Tencent and Alibaba who uh, rule the uh, whole system. Uh, in India, it is it is the government sponsored infrastructure which uh, which rules, and the, uh, the infrastructure started off with. Uh, the NPCI, which came up with uh, UPI, which was which is really one of the top, uh, the best products around the world right now, in terms of providing transfers uh, of payments, which is the first part of or first duty of the world of finance to enable people to transact with each other, uh, irrespective of whether they are on Alibaba equivalent or Alipay or Tencent equivalent, which is WeChat Pay. So in China, you can be on one of those, but not on both. Whereas in India, you can be on Google Pay, which is using the UPI, and transfer to a bank account, or transfer to a mobile number, or transfer to eventually maybe a, a corporate using a GST number, and so on. So there is a huge new infrastructure being put in place in India, which is uh, called EPA uh, uh, framework, data empowerment uh, uh, framework. Uh, which rides on top of all these new technologies that India has come up with in the last five years, which is yet to sort of uh, see uh, uh, a big, uh, 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 you know, benefit out of it. Right now, we're seeing the problems of GST and all that, but eventually we'll see the benefits. So in some sense, there is an ABC of fintech, 
which is A for AI, analytics, automation, uh, B for blockchain, big data, Bitcoin, C for cloud, crypto, and cybersecurity, uh, which is what I have kind of described in more detail in the book. Uh, and you can read it and let me know your comments. But some of these, or all of these, are going to be what will determine the future of fintech. Uh, so going from the past to the future, you know, we talked about how the big tech uh, really developed around uh, WWW, that is World Wide Web, and the big data. And essentially, they finance, uh, they pretty much bypass finance. So if you look at it, the technology that Amazon has in Alexa or, or Facebook has or Google has is not currently being used in the advanced banks because the banks have regulations, the banks have other uh, restrictions and so on. So uh, that's really the big change that will happen uh, in terms of whether those uh, techs get their uh, uh, opportunity to uh, engage in the world of finance. So there are these ecosystems, which is in the US FANG ecosystem, which is Facebook, uh, Apple, Amazon, uh, Netflix, Google. There is a BAT ecosystem in China, which is uh, Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent. Uh, I'm not referring to the BAT, uh, which is currently kind of infamous uh, um, for coronavirus. Uh, this is the BAT acronym. Uh, versus uh, what we have in India is really NPCI. And NPCI is really uh, a kind of a data layer or, 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 or you know, a, a, a micro structure of the market on top of which everybody can have access and create their own applications. Uh, sort of a thousand flowers bloom kind of an approach rather than two, three large entities. Uh, of course, with Geo, we will see how things happen. Uh, so it's really the MASA, which is my favorite acronym, which is uh, Microsoft, uh, Apple, uh, Amazon, SoftBank, and Alibaba, which really rule the world today. And all of them have their uh, arms into the world of banks and financial services in different ways. Uh, the big question is uh, whether banks will remain uh, uh, the, uh, the trusted entities. Uh, in some sense, technology companies already have more trust than banks. Uh, Google has more information on us than what we know also about ourselves sometimes. Amazon knows what exactly we buy and uh, what we eat and so on and so forth. And they are kind of expanding their tentacles into other parts of uh, the value chain. Uh, so that's the war of the trust. Who does the consumer and a millennial consumer really trust? Do they really get into a bank? Will they want to uh, work with uh, privacy? Will they want to have a blockchain type architecture, uh, which, uh, which kind of uh, rules out if you know a bank and if you know the banker, then you kind of uh, are far more in you know, an uh, old world setup. With the tech entities, uh, you don't really ever meet anybody. So then it's all about data uh, security. And that's where the blockchain really, really comes in, which will be the war of trust, which will be fought uh, in, in the next uh, decade or so. Uh, we have already seen decision-making systems becoming commonplace in banking applications and financial applications. It will go to the world of AI, which is really the war about war of knowledge, uh, from human-assisted systems to human-independent systems and systems that learn themselves and write code themselves. So uh, those are the areas where the slow evolution, which is what banks typically prefer or the financial system prefers, uh, that's the DNA versus the machine learning, deep learning, where we could create a way for a, a, a one of the most complex games uh, of Go, which was learned by an algorithm by itself in a far shorter time than what the human would have taken. So that's really the process of learning that become, that accelerates uh, as time goes by. So as I see, it will really become uh, uh, eventually finance as a service rather than being provided by banks or so on. And it will be, it will be really something that uh, uh, will be enabled by IoT, which is Internet of Things, 5G, uh, we talked about the fast uh, uh, telecommunication data speeds, and last but not the least, the quantum. The quantum is really quantum computer, which can break all, all, plus, all records in terms of processing that conventional computers, supercomputers can have. It's also a big risk because they can break all the passwords and the security uh, kind of uh, uh, question becomes a whole lot different in the world of quantum. Hopefully, we have some time to adjust to that. The Coming back to the fundamental problem that I talked about, it's really money. Uh, is there money for all? 
is we have so much more money now in terms of the money supply, but is it available for everybody? And the answer to that is is no. And we know that uh, uh, very well in India. We, we've seen the migrant uh, uh, populations, their uh, their situation. They really don't have access to credit. And one of the ideas that I've really talked about in the book is uh, is called UCAL or Universal Credit Access Limit. So just like uh, uh, we have the ability to uh, uh, we have the freedom to speak, we have the freedom to purchase the land and so on. We should have the, uh, uh, the state should make credit accessible by way of the limit instead of making other uh, initiatives such as universal basic income, UBI, which is what is talked about generally in Europe and other more advanced countries. So uh, COVID-19 really fast forwards the future in my opinion, uh, because it kind of shows that our entire progress as a humanity can be halted uh, by an invisible enemy uh, and our current tools uh, to fight are two quotes. And we are asking everybody to sit at home uh, or uh, like bunkers, right? like war. Everything goes, in, goes into a bunker. But that war cannot really continue because uh, we cannot continue uh, in, in that sense uh, uh, in bunkers or homes forever. So life will become increasingly digital as it already has been uh, and not just because it is cool and futuristic which is why it became digital earlier but now increasingly it will become digital because it is safer uh, because the alternative form which is more physical form whether it's money being exchanged notes being exchanged or drawn from ATM or whatever uh, or other forms of physical interactions etc will be considered more risky than before till the vaccine comes along but that may be one two years late at the minimum and by the time the behaviors would have probably changed. So there are fundamental changes uh, which are happening in the world with the wellness. And in some sense, we will have to start going within versus going out. And by within, we'll have to know more about ourselves, our, our in some sense, biology, our understanding of what makes us tick inside, rather than just talking about space and rather than just talking about, uh, you know, uh, uh, physical development outside. So looking at uh, the government response, uh, really, uh, as I mentioned, to Corona uh, crisis, uh, they really responded with more money, which is uh, which which is created, uh, which is going to create even more bigger dislocations in the world of uh, finance with incomes and balance sheets. So, so there is probably a need of 20 trillion US dollars to uh, fill that uh, two or three months of income loss across the world, uh, Global, if you look at the global GDP. And that's something that the central banks will ultimately come and rescue and by printing money. So what the US has done, doubling their central bank balance sheet, what Japan has done, what Germany has done, which is very unique. They have, they have been one of the most conservative com uh, countries. Uh, they have had hyperinflation in the, uh, between the two world wars, which actually made them which actually made Nazism come, uh, but despite, so they, they are very anti-deficits, but they have come up with deficits the first time after the Second World War. That shows the uh, the challenges that we face uh, and the countries face. India is obviously far more cautious so far, but it's far more vulnerable. Uh, so our only hope will be probably that hopefully our population is more uh, hardy, but the jury is still out. Uh, and the big question is, money cannot really repair uh, uh, biology. Uh, and by that, what I really mean is that in future, what we'll have to look at uh, is not just fintech, but also uh, understanding more about organisms, which is where there will be opportunities for fintech players as well. It's a big opportunity as well as a big risk uh, for banking, financial services players. Uh, today, a fintech and a bank are pretty much equivalent. Uh, so, opportunity is really for either of them to embed into the digital experiences. Uh, the digital experience may be of, uh, of Netflix watching a movie or for taking a sample at home for a rapid antibody test for Corona. Can the payments become automated? Can the, uh, can the risk management, risk evaluation become automated and automatically plug into uh, models, plug into those experiences? Because what is really happening is that uh, with lockdowns, essentially that is similar to a global demonetization. 
other. We can't move, we can't meet each other, so we can't exchange currency. So it's really physical currency becomes useless, which is slowly, slowly what has been happening, kind of becomes uh, uh, a one landslide kind of a, uh, a change. So it becomes essentially go digital, contactless, virtual, and secure, which is something that RBI government talked about as well in his first press conference. So, Post Corona, he actually said to banks go digital at the end of his conference. So obviously, it's it's primarily a health challenge. So it requires uh, and deserves different solutions, uh, but it does mark a clean break from history. So in some sense, in the world of finance, it was seen that the global financial crisis of 2008 became somewhat of a, 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 a break from history, just like the Great Depression of 30s was. So it's really pre-GFC, post-GFC. I think the world will look like pre-corona and post-corona. Hopefully a sort of orderly new world post-corona. So with that, I sort of uh, uh, would stop uh, my uh, session. And I'll do it back to you, uh, Karan or Shailesh, right? Yes, thanks. So, Karan, can you uh, give me right to share my screen? Yes, yes. Thank you so much, Mr. Fertke, for those wonderful insights. Thank you for everything. Hi, can you hear me, Shelly, sir? Yes, I can hear you. So, okay, great. I can hear you now. Uh, with, we're just making you the host now. Suraj, can you please activate? Yes, sir. I'm just waiting for uh, Suraj to make me host. And yeah. then I'll start uh, the discussions. I'll show a few slides. Mr. Sanjay, you have to transfer the rights since uh, you are the. Sorry, what is that? Yeah, can you transfer the rights because you're the uh, speaker? Okay, let me check how to do that. Uh, yeah. Can you check now? Yes, I am that now. So. Okay, so I am. Uh, it, it is saying that I need to restart my machine for sharing the screen, so which is quite uh, weird because I was doing that till now. So I will quit the Zoom and rejoin. Just give me one second. Sure, sure, absolutely. But for that, but Zoom is asking me to rejoin. Okay. So, Mr. Fadki, we've got a few uh, sort of... Uh, yeah, we can take a question in case... Uh, we take a question? Yeah, sure, sure. So, there's a question by Professor Radhika Lobo. In fact, Professor Lobo is a very senior economics professor at Christ College in Bangalore. Okay. So, she's asking whether Indian companies have the choice of accepting investments from Chinese investors, even when we know that the investors are probably going to use sensitive data to their advantage. You know, so is this heading towards any form of digitized warfare and, you know, um, data misuse. So yeah, it's a, it, if you can say a few words there. Sure, sure. So, yeah, I, I think Shailesh is joined. So, just maybe two statements, uh, but we should discuss this later, Radhika. I think uh, data localization uh, is a big theme going forward. There is a uh, there is an India-China standoff, as we talk about, obviously, at, uh, at this point. Uh, and uh, just remember that whether it's Chinese or Americans or whoever, ultimately it's all about data security uh, rather than who has access to data. So we'll discuss this more, I think, later. I think uh, Shailesh has his slides already on. Great. Great. Thank you, Mr. Fatke. Uh, Mr. Duri, sounds good. Looks like this worked. So 
you're on mute unmute my audio okay so i, I unmuted myself and you guys can see my screen yeah you can see it now okay yes thank you thank you uh, everybody for the time today in the evening uh, let me uh, briefly talk about myself uh, for a minute or two so uh, i have experience of about uh, 30 years in financial markets and in driving technological innovations in financial markets uh, i am not an engineer uh, Uh, my my basic background is uh, in the finance side but i am passionate about technology and uh, uh, what drives me uh, day in and day out uh, from my childhood is uh, how i can use uh, technology to um, better the world around us uh, it is not just for myself but for Uh, the people that are around us so that is what has been driving me so uh, and uh, uh, in fact uh, whatever jobs that i did i tried to infuse a huge amount of technology in it after my career in 1990 uh, and my job was to start india's first private sector bank we we are just uh, opened up india after 91 liberalization and the country was going to have a thanks after the gap of the 40 years and uh, i was just 23 years old uh, that time i went and uh, purchased the first chip and pin atm in the world i got it manufactured from a company in thane in so at that Uh, RBI said it's nothing good to uh, magnetic uh, chip, magnetic uh, strip uh, ATM, and I was very dejected because I thought that is the future that is going to happen, and we scrapped that ATM in 1995. But in uh, uh, 2015, RBI made finally compulsory for everybody to have chip, uh, chip and pin in every credit card and every uh, debit card. so that so i was uh, what uh, 20 years ahead of time in that uh, matter and uh, th- that is been driving me all along i, I thought of uh, india coming uh, uh, analytics uh, powerhouse to the world in late 97 in late 90s and it it took me about few years to get things right and start my own organization and uh, i started decimal point analytics into zone 3 which we wanted to become a powerhouse in the world and we are slowly becoming a, a, a powerhouse for the globe in, in uh, for doing analytics so, and uh, the way we do analytics is we use a technology and we uh, on that we put a lot of uh, energetic people to to the analytics and the way we choose people is very interesting uh, i give a lot of importance to the family background uh, i go and when recruit people from the humblest of the background and then give them the most cutting edge exposure because that is how the country will go if the, if if we can bring equality in the become uh, far richer and far more stable that is value and um, uh, sanjay talked about uh, npci uh, in uh, late 90s i was in the rbi committee to think of the entire architecture for having digital currencies and uh, uh, so npci was one of that so uh, i had to uh, given my thoughts 20 years i have been uh, uh, in maybe late 1990s and early 2000s on how digital currencies should come out and especially how the settlement should happen so uh, my my passion that time was not the how the money would get transferred be- between various people but how banks can settle that money in real time basis on 24 by 7 and hence uh, you know, i associated myself finally with 
forming of uh, CCI. I was part of that committee, and that's the backbone of having digital currencies. And uh, as a result of that, I, I started country's first money market mutual fund. Before that, people had to keep money in current account if you have money for one or two days. But that was the first way of digitalizing the currency, of uh, changing the way how we can do that. I started in 1997. And then the first uh, bond fund I started in 1998. And that is how uh, I have went and built my uh, career always thinking about how new things can help uh, the society transform themselves. Now, uh, apart from running decimal point, uh, last few months, uh, uh, I have started a new organization called Imperial Galaxy because I think airships can change the way the world functions the, uh, and uh, especially India and India's poor can really benefit from it. I'll talk about it uh, briefly going forward. Uh, we don't have too much time. I will try to finish this uh, talk in about 20 minutes. I have about 50 slides to run through. So I'll be uh, quick. Some of the points are already covered by Sanjay. Uh, so what is the current situation? Uh, current situation, all of us know the world is in lockdown. Uh, but we have been doing work with RBA uh, in during the lockdown period uh, for RBA. And we found that uh, the effect of lockdown is the most uh, in the cities, in the metros. It is uh, the least in the villages. So the drop in GDP uh, is correlated with how high the per capita GDP was of a particular location. So... Uh, Rich places saw so the maximum and the poor places. However, most of uh, the burden of falling GDP uh, is borne by poor. And it has some social implications. I'll talk about it at the end. Uh, and work from home is becoming uh, a reality. Now, this is very interesting to watch uh, uh, in this space because the te technology for work from home existed now for last 15, 20 years, and it became a reality in India maybe in last uh, 10 years, with everybody having some, set up, some sort of broadband at home. But it was considered to be uh, that uh, not very uh, uh, good thing to work from home people who were not very careful about their career, who were not very ambitious would work from home. That was the uh, general perception. Uh, how, how can you show your good work if you are working from home? That was the perception. So people would want, will try to avoid working from home as much as possible. What has made change is the psychology now. Now everybody is forced to work from home. So uh, A, the managers know now that you don't have to have a person sitting next to you to ensure that he or she works. They, they are self-driven. I'll talk about this more later. And B, uh, your good work can be shown uh, even if you're sitting at home to your boss or your not worked at home. So that's going to change over next 15, 20 years, in next few months, uh, in, in fact, not in 15, 20 years. Uh, the digitization is a new way of recovery. How will the recovery happen? We are seeing a huge dislocation. Uh, we are seeing migrants uh, walking back to their house, uh, to their native places. Uh, I will mention that at the end, but the, the recovery is going to be digital. What is uh, digital means that entire processes that the companies have have to be digitized now. So uh, if uh, you are buying an insurance, term insurance is something that you can buy online. But if you want to buy uh, more complex products, insurance company assumed that uh, uh, it would come to your house and explain product. 
and that was an assumption there is no need for uh, agent to come to house to explain a product which is which lends itself to digitization uh, but that was an assumption and hence uh, uh, complex insurance products were sold face to face uh, and now insurance companies are realizing that it is not the case or let's just take case of interview processes in case of hiring uh, companies expected that the person would walk into your office to give an interview that was not required for many many years everybody had a skype for at least for last 10 years and a video camera in their mobile maybe for last 8 years so people could have given interviews from their home but everybody said you come to office to give an interview now now that is changed and and money and everything is going to change because of that uh, and the, you know, this this is going to empower your employees empower your engage you can engage with customers better you can optimize your operations so a lot of uh, loss of uh, in in uh, when you operate in just physical environment without digitizing your operation and also you can uh, transform your products you can develop new products new services which are purely digital in nature in fact we have been talking to our customers on this and customers have bought into this vision so uh, on 15th of uh, march uh, just before the lockdown was announced by the government of india decimal point analytics was 250 com- employee com- company and today we are about 350 people in last uh, 60 working days we have hired 100 people in the company and why we had 100 people in uh, in last 60 days when the world is in lockdown because we are helping our clients go digital and do the with going forward uh, so this is where the digital adoption is uh, happening as happened in the past so banking is always with forefront digital entertainment uh, was forced to become digital by netflix uh, grocery was forced to become digital by amazon but now everything is becoming digital as i mentioned insurance was the least now they are forced to become digital travel telecom carriers utilities everything that you think of as a business is becoming at a rapid pace and this is seeing a uh, uh, what is uh, causing this there is some internet of things location detection cloud computing augmented reality smart sensors advanced robotics data analytics and 3d printing all these are playing a role and will play a role in future in ensuring that the world economy comes back on its feet pretty soon let's take one simple example of 3d printing uh, You, uh, may, many times we buy small small trinkets in a house those trinkets uh, uh, can can be easily be printed uh, in, in using 3d print at a printer at your home just like you print a letter or a uh, or a photograph at your home uh, and that is how the world would move uh, pretty soon in fact uh, there would be digital twin uh, master uh, uh, copy of every item that would be kept on internet which you can purchase and print especially things like let us say how much trouble we had in acquiring masks or acquiring respirators and those things can be easily printed on 3d printers or things for covid test covid test things can be printed on a 3d printer if you are 3d printers present everywhere there would be no shortage of any commodity for next crisis today's pandemic is uh, a respiratory uh, pandemic uh, previous pandemic which is still going on so there are two pandemics going on in the in world right now the first pandemic started in 1980 which is aids pandemic which is a sexually transmitted disease uh, which is still going on it has not been cancelled as a pandemic it is still going on Now on that on top of that we have second pandemic which is respiratory disease pandemic uh, and and the response for, for each was different uh, 
in aids uh, you know that your own behavior would cause uh, uh, the disease to you or not in case of uh, uh, covid you might be a uh, passer by and might get a disease and the the next pandemic that might come might have a different feature and you can't keep the things in storage uh, built and kept readily but you can easily 3d print those if certain things happen so and that is the that is the main advantage of digital you, you can create goods and commodities where you want when you want in the quantities that you want so digital assets will now become more valuable than physical assets a digital twin master copy is more valuable than the physical copy of the good by itself any wherever you have physical assets those need to be digitized uh, you need to have sensors on them so that they, they could be monitored uh, remotely uh, let us take a case of atms uh, we are talking of the world going cashless but in last two months i have seen the biggest cash withdrawal from atms that I, that i ever seen in last 30 years biggest ever cash withdrawals from atm why because people are afraid people want to hold dirty cash the cash is dirty but people want to hold that to the dirty cash because they are afraid of what is going to happen tomorrow and whether computer will work power supply will be there or not so people are holding on to that cash now how do i monitor atms how do how do, how do i maintain those atms if i have sensors which give me a signal if atm is about to fail managing those atms uh, becomes easier in the era of social distancing so each and every asset physical asset needs to become digital so that it can be managed at lower cost and with safety to the uh, repair people and that means more data will be available and the data would go in data marts and uh, a lot of information would be uh, gathered and analyzed and actions will be taken as i mentioned uh, all processes of the organizations will be moving to cloud very soon so everything that happens in organization uh, will be digitized and will go to cloud so risk management right now happens in excel on a, somebody's uh, desktop would go on to cloud let's say examination in a in a, in a college uh, happens on a piece of paper uh, sitting on a, on a bench it will go to cloud everything that you can think which can go on to cloud will go on to cloud uh, another thing that will go on to cloud is all the touch points so customer touch points supplier touch points uh, touch points with regulators all of them will go uh, digital so for example now rbi is or, or irda is still continuing to monitor banks or insurance companies right and earlier they would go and visit the branches but now uh, they don't want to visit the branches because of social distancing issues so they are de developing new tools to monitor the organizations that they are tracking and that will become omnipresent everywhere auditors should be able to do audit sitting in their home of the companies that they want to audit uh, we, we are getting requests from pe funds how can we uh, assess companies uh, uh, worth sitting at our homes uh, can a drone go and visit a factory and send us photographs of those those factory the factory really exist or not before we invest into a factory into a, a organization and those things will happen and that is technology is going to see a huge huge boom and analytics is going to see a huge boom post pandemic uh, and every sector is going to get digital and uh, you cannot say that now i am not a digital sector uh, uh, whether you are a doctor whether with educationalist whether you you are uh, running a barber shop you have to become digital and innovations is the revolutionized business we are already seeing that with our clients as i mentioned in last 
uh, two months. Clients are rethinking their business models and trying to build new things. So uh, order taking in a restaurant, uh, robots will take. Robo here, here is shown as a humanoid, humanoid robo, robo, but it may not be humanoid. It can be uh, just a machine which interacts with you. Or banking, uh, right now just uh, cash withdrawals and statements are happening uh, in an ATM. But uh, why not loan disbursements, loan sanctions, housing loan sanctions happen offline uh, or happen online? And that will, happen, that will very quickly happen online. I'm sure of that. Phone stores uh, are, can be run by robots. And chatbots uh, using AI is going to be a big game changer. People uh, want to use high tech, but they want high touch also. They want to uh, get the feeling that somebody is listening to them. And that is where uh, uh, AI-driven chatbot comes into picture. Uh, will be solved by AI and uh, more difficult queries be answered by the human being. Uh, even policing will change. It's changing right now. Uh, we, we have seen that, uh, that uh, in Mumbai, police are using drones to monitor social distancing in slums with very positive results. Uh, and uh, so policing is becoming digital. And will continue to become digital going forward because this COVID is not going to go away. If, if right now, unfortunately, 200 police personnel have uh, died across India because of COVID, uh, police would be forced to use more digital technologies and their heirs would also come into picture. I'll talk about that more in later. API is something that is unsung hero of uh, the uh, technology revolution. Everybody talks about AI, everybody talks about IoT, but it is API which allows all the technologies to talk to each other. And APIs are going to change the world uh, uh, far, far more than the technologies by themselves because APIs would allow us to give a seamless experience. Those of us who are old enough to uh, have dealt with uh, VCRs uh, of the old world, you would know that uh, a particular VCR will go with, with particular TV only. But nowadays you can fix uh, any device to any machine because they have API uh, talking to each other. And that would happen in more and more frequently. Now let us say, take example of your washing machine at your home. If it breaks down, you have to first call somebody to repair the washing machine and uh, for first find out what is the fault in the washing machine. And then the person comes, finds out what is the fault, goes back and brings a part to replace that part and then fixes. So there are two trips required at least uh, for fixing your washing machine or freeze broken in your house. So in the era of social distancing, you don't want people to come twice to your house. You don't want people to come even once to your house. But if your uh, fridge is broken, washing machine is broken, uh, if the, the fridge can talk to your mobile phone on API and uh, tell, tell the app what is broken, and uh, then that app goes and tells the uh, uh, repairman that this is what is broken, then he will just come with that part and fix the part. Or if you are uh, savvy enough, then the part will be mailed to you and you can fix the part yourself. So that is going to be a big revolution going to happen. Data explosion is going to happen. I'm running short of time, so I will run uh, quickly. Uh, data is going to explode by 10 times in, in seven years time, in my opinion, because of all these technology changes. It's going to create huge opportunities uh, for everybody. Uh, for, and data analytics will become a game changer all kinds of businesses will be able to monitor uh, their assets, monitor, monitor their customers' uh, feelings, uh, monitor their requirements and fulfill their requirements at lower and lower costs. So, uh, this will be divert and their main business model will become that we want to sell our data to us. 
Google is free of cost because Google is selling your data data to others. But that just what Google can do that. There are other people who can do it. Right now, RBI has issued us a circular on open banking APIs. If open banking APIs become reality, that means bank can make money on your data more than it can make money uh, lending to you. And that means bank would reduce your interest rate pretty soon uh, if you allow the, it's your data sold to other people. Now, this is an area that I want to spend five, 10 minutes talking about. So Airship is a solution stack in the post-COVID world. So what is Airship? Airship is a lighter than air aircraft, which uh, floats uh, in the air uh, because it has hydrogen or helium, a light gas, and then it propels itself uh, uh, using a, a small engine. Uh, as compared to he heavy aircrafts, so a jet engine, jet aircraft, or a helicopter is heavy. So if the engine of a jet air, uh, jet airway airplane fails, it the aircraft crashes. If the fan of helicopter starts stops spinning, in case of airships that doesn't happen because it floats by itself. The uh, engine just directs it to where it uh, to go. And uh, airships, and since you don't require energy to put it up in the air, the cost is much lower uh, than uh, normal aircraft. Uh, so, and airships can be open air if you're able to travel passengers. So you, you can think of a cruise ship, like uh, uh, if many, many of you have seen your Titanic movie. So people can be moving around in airship, just like they were. Move, they are moving around in Titanic airship. It is open there, so there is no. Uh, uh, and that doesn't. That means that uh, you can maintain social distancing, and you the chance of uh, caught, uh, catching the virus is far less. And airships uh, can help mend supply chains and can uh, uh, deliver goods uh, very quickly uh, at minimal level of risk. Uh, why why that, that can happen is because uh, airships don't require uh, uh, airports to land. They don't require air, uh, air strips to land. They can land on any open field uh, and they can take off from any open field vertically. So it can, Every village uh, playground is potentially a uh, airship landing point, uh, and every Ram Ramlila Mandir is a, 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 a Ramlila Maidan is airship uh, takeoff point. So that means supply chains can be reconfigured. So in India, we have got uh, uh, six lakh villages. But we have got 7,000 railway stations only. That means only 1% of villages are connected by railway. Or just railway line passing through a village doesn't mean that it is connected by a railway. And the, the, the people don't benefit. Uh, similarly, highways. Uh, very few uh, villages have highways touching to their uh, places. But airships can take off from anywhere and land. So, for example, if uh, farmers in Bihar are producing a lot of milk and there is demand for milk in Dubai, airship can pick up the, that milk in Bihar, uh, travel at a speed of maybe 200 kilometers per hour, reach Dubai in about eight hours' time, and deliver that milk to Dubai in eight hours' time directly uh, without uh, uh, having to change. So, right now, if you want to send milk from Bihar to Dubai, you have to first send from Bihar to maybe uh, Nawasheva port. From Nawasheva port, uh, it will stay there for two days. Then a ship will come, ship will take, uh, and then it will go to Dubai. Then from Dubai, it will be unloaded. A truck will come, and truck will take truck for distribution. So all those uh, things will be taken out. It will point to point delivery. So it, every can be managed. 
So now we are seeing supply chains getting disrupted. Drivers don't want to come and work, uh, take the trucks for delivery. There's a lot of stocking of food was happening initially. Vestige of perishable goods are happening. All those things can be avoided if we are airships going from any point to any point at a very low cost and delivering goods. A large airship uh, ship's cost is as low as a, uh, a normal ocean ship's uh, cost. While a mid-sized uh, airship uh, cost is the cost of running is like a truck's cost, but distance traveled is less because it, there are no no turning points uh, in the sky. You don't have to climb a, uh, uh, a hill uh, taking 20 turns and get down a hill taking 20 turns. And there are no checkpoints in, in the sky. There are no toll lakas in the sky. So the movement of course can happen faster. And uh, it is possible to have unmanned remote controlled uh, uh, vehicle ships for delivery. And there are many other things that we can do. So just like uh, uh, you can use it for policing, uh, monitoring crowds, you can use it for monitoring crops, uh, crops. Uh, and uh, it can be used for delivery of medicines and other essential items. Uh, uh, airship is a big item, big machine. It can have drones on, on board where, where airship can just keep on traveling and the drones can keep on going up and down and make deliveries and come back to the mother uh, airship. So that would make the delivery, uh, let's say we require blood, blood supply in the remote corner of, of country. Uh, right now, uh, police have to open a, a green channel for making tra transport of that, or that organ very quickly. But an airship can deliver that uh, without any intervention by any police. Uh, airship for passenger travel, uh, this is going to be a big opportunity right now. Uh, because, because of social distancing, number of passengers that can travel in an aircraft have fallen. That means the tickets uh, in, uh, in a few months would become very costly. Uh, it is expected that uh, uh, ticket cost will go up 9x to cover for the loss of uh, number of seats in a normal aircraft. Uh, at that, and uh, at that time, it becomes unviable to take a jet engine uh, aircraft, but an airship where windows can be opened even during flight. Uh, still becomes feasible at a lower cost of transport. Uh, uh, so this is to, to air and um, to bring it to market uh, maybe in next two three years. Uh, there are other things that can uh, happen, uh, like uh, cell phone towers can be replaced with uh, tethered uh, airships. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, our technology partners are doing uh, work on this, and we would be uh, we're discussing in discussions with uh, telecom companies. One airship can replace hundred uh, uh, mobile towers with better coverage, lower cost. So mobile phone costs can remain low. Uh, uh, telecom companies can increase profits uh, or, or reduce their losses even at the current pricing and uh, we can still enjoy good internet, even in the remote areas or even densely populated cities also, as well. So, other applications, I, I have run out of time, so I will skip this. Uh, let me just, uh, Karan, I'm taking a few minutes more. I think we started late. So hope we can uh, run over for five minutes more. Is okay, uh, Karan? Sure. Do you want to uh, stop? Uh, maybe maybe for the for another two three minutes and then you know there are two or three questions that uh, the audience has asked so maybe we can take that. Yes. Okay. So just quickly, uh, aggregate supply initially would fall because of COVID, but aggregate de demand would fall more. Uh, so that would lead to a bad deflation. Uh, so prices will fall initially because the demand is not sufficient, uh, but because of the all technologies that I mentioned in my presentation, everything will become very, very cheap uh, in next few years and we'll have good deflation uh, in next two, three years. And this is spite of the money supply that Sanjay mentioned. 
uh, whatever money supply uh, central banks are going to print is not going to uh, to take care of the deflatory deflationary trends that i see data security is very important now because everything is digitized uh, and uh, people are worried about employment uh, but i am not worried about employment uh, if you digitize more assets more jobs will get created we don't have time to discuss that but i i see employment deluge coming a huge uh, number of jobs created for people with relevant mindset and relevant skill set social fabric is something that we need to very be very about uh, right now poor people uh, have suffered the most and uh, already we have started seeing riots in us in last 2 3 days and i am fearful that we will have that situation coming in india unless we take care of our poor and their self esteem especially self esteem of the poor not just keep uh, throwing food at them but treating them with dignity and i think interest rates across the world are going to go to zero pretty soon because mda is a economics uh, uh, school first so we we'll talk about interest rates uh, my opinion is that everywhere interest rates will go to zero so thanks thank you ripan for the time thank you so very much mr duri very uh, exciting insights that you've shared especially on airships and how we're going to see a change in transportation uh, technology uh, thank you to both the speakers actually Uh, i mean i had a few questions that i wanted to post but given that we are uh, you know running short of time i was thinking maybe we can take the questions from the audience first and then um, you know and then come through so there are two questions of course uh, you know i'll come back to mr fadke because there was a very interesting questions on uh, data wars uh, so i see that you've uh, you know you've answered uh, you answered it quite shortly but i was wondering if you i uh, wanted to spend a few minutes on that because that's something that's on top of a lot of people's minds especially with you know private data being accessible by uh, very very large tech companies okay so do you want to start with that yeah let's start okay. with that yeah okay. i think uh, yeah so i think uh, it's uh, it's i think uh, going to be the defining feature of the uh, the digital world is about data security i think shail has talked about it at the end and everything becomes digital there is no physical identity everything is data bits and bytes uh, and uh, there is no other way to confirm identity uh, apart from apart from security and apart from the uh, the algorithms uh, the biases uh, the uh, you know the, the the whole notion of uh, when we see something we 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 attach we see something physically we have a certain means of uh, you know uh, connecting uh, uh, a reality to it but when 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 it's digital there is no way to actually create a a a a reality to it but that's what we are forced to do now whether it's digital data of any kind so unless it is backed by uh, a notion of a uh, 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 very very strong security very very strong operational uh, standards uh, uh, notion of democracy which is inbuilt into that etc somebody asked about cryptocurrency for example uh, cryptocurrency is a great idea for a decentralized uh, uh, world uh, but a decentralized world runs counter to the current world which is driven by nation states so a truly decentralized uh, uh, currency which is a permissionless network like bitcoin will not work because we have we have countries and countries still uh, decide their own monetary policies uh, right at the end of the day yep. a program cannot define that because we don't want the program to uh, to sort of start uh, uh, taking so much control in some sense of our life so so i think data data is really the big thing and uh, i i believe you're starting a course on data and, uh, analytics so i think it's a fantastic thing uh, uh, shelly has talked about how uh, everything is going to become more and more digital and how that's going to lead to employment deluge and all that so the underlying assumption to all that is that the data that we are transferring into a cloud into a uh, into an open api into uh, you know any kind of a 
third party application uh, connected programs connected vehicles connected insurance whatever connection that we want to talk about eventually connecting to other galaxies and so on i think the underlying assumption is that it is actually uh, full proof and it is safe uh, i think for now we have enough mechanisms to take care of that uh, uh, so there are certain simple precautions that all of us have to take and as we as we become more digital we just have to kind of start becoming more careful uh, both in our personal life as well as professional life uh, uh, once quantum computer comes obviously things change quite drastically and then then it's a you know data war of a different kind but i think we'll have another 6 uh, to uh, 12 years uh, for that unless some startup comes up with something uh, who knows you know, here it is yeah. sure no and, and while we're talking about digitization and the huge uh, you know uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, growth and spurt in data accumulation that both of you all have spoken about and there's a very interesting question that uh, you know how do we ensure this rise in technology dependency uh, in terms of products and services does not leave behind uh, you know the less privileged and how do we sort of ensure that data and digitization is more democratic and not limited yeah current can i can i answer that question uh miss current duri or or sanjay one of you all can take yeah, uh, I, yeah i would like to answer yeah. that question so uh, te- technology so, by itself actually is a great leveler so if you look at the cost of technology access it has fallen by a factor of 10000x in last 10 years so if you if you want to transfer a 1 kb of data that has fallen by 10000x now uh, if you have a geo phone uh, you can get uh, 1 uh, gb data for 10 rupees now what can 1 gb of data give you right it can give you access the best minds in the world you can go on on youtube and watch what they are talking what videos uh, they they are uh, they, they are putting up so when i was i was young i wanted to know what the best minds are saying i was staying in thane and the only way i could uh, find out what the best people were saying was go to the uh, town library so there is a town library in thane i used to go there and uh, within few months i finished those books then the second port of call was go uh, and find out second hand books that are sold in in mumbai on on footpath and search and find out those books and buy those books for 1 rupee a piece boy can was senior but for a young guy poor but can spend 10 rupees will have more access to to knowledge than what i had 30 years ago so poor are going to benefit now it doesn't matter whether whether i am in a village okay my, my cousins in village they didn't even had the access to library nor to second hand books in thane i at least i had those access right no it doesn't matter i could be in uh, staying in a jungle uh, growing up a young boy or see, staying in the best biggest town as long as i have access to that 5 rupees 10 rupees I, I don't have to have daily basis right i could get 10 rupees in a in a uh, week and that 10 rupees in a week i use it 1 gb data and download things and one week is going to change the world it is most of the poor are going to get the knowledge the skills if they have the mindset i said the mindset is important if they have the mindset no. to bring themselves up technology is going to be biggest leveler that that and that is the cause i am saying it is going to be a biggest deflationary trend because what china did 20 years ago was to well, take their poor to the factory Uh, and make them goods cheaply what india can do is we are given them mobile phone 
and we are giving them data at in this their young kids are going to change the world they they are going to get skills they, so somebody talks about quantum computer they'll go and find find out what is quantum computer they will become fantastic programmers they they will change the world and that is going to be a differentiary force in the world going forward I, i'm sitting in africa we are clients in africa a lot of people are acquiring newer and newer skills using uh, uh, technology at very cheap prices and transferring money using mpesa in india same thing is happening so technology is not a divider it is a connector sure Sorry. no thank you thank you for that you know while we are with you just one quick question that that has also come up is mm-hmm. is on the airships aspect and you know one yes. of the greatest issues has been their uh, safety record so uh, yes. you know how is it going to be different this time to convince the market that it's going to be another that's very good uh, that, 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 that is a very good question that is a very good question so uh, we need to put things in context so who who were the leaders in airship technology germans germans were dominating the airship technology okay and who, who lost the second world war germans lost the second world war we all know that history is written by the winners and not the losers okay so it was decided that this technology be maligned okay now let us take how many people die in road accident in india does anybody know the number One half lakh people, ढाई लाख लोग मरते हैं road accidents से. How many people die in US in road accident? Thirty five thousand people die in road accident every year. Thirty five thousand people die in road accident every year. How many people died because of airships in the twenty years that they were op- in operational? Thousand people died. Maybe two thousand people died in twenty years period. How many aircrafts crash every year across the world? Five or six. Every aircraft crash, jet air, airways crash. Two hundred people die, hundred people die, right? So everything that you do has a risk. How do you portray the risk? Has a political connotation behind it, and it and right right now we can make it cheap, better, cheaper, safer because that. Hundred years ago, they are using canvas, they are using wood, they are using uh, uh, steel to uh, the airships. Now we can use carbon fiber. We can use so uh, so many other materials and uh, which are fire resistant, lighter, uh, and we can have better control using AI and IoT. If we if we take all this into account, then airships would be safer. Understand the ethics and why technology dies out, and that is the greatest challenge that that uh, we are going to have uh, in my company. It is not a technology by itself, but the politics behind the technology is is more important. Sure, great. No, thank you so very much. Of course, uh, you know all valid points. Um, so we're we're very very close to calling it a calling it a day where we just have two minutes, uh, Mr. Fadke. I have one last question for you. It's more of an amalgamation of two questions. Uh, but what does the future of Indian banking look like? Uh, do you think it'll be closer to uh, you know the Amazons and Apples of the world? And in some way, can India take a take a huge jump in the fintech race? Uh, you know it it's lost out on a lot of other areas but can you can do you see the country making a strong effort in the fintech area and becoming a leader uh, you know given your experience in this space would be great if you could you know throw some light there sure so uh, i think uh, we do definitely have a chance uh, because we have set up the infrastructure uh, in a way that is uh, far more democratic uh, it is something which is uh, accessible to all uh it is something which uh, enables uh, you know gst is one of the first uh, shall i talk about apis it's one of the first government uh, uh, driven api project uh, in pretty much the most of the world uh, and the speed of uh, you know the connectedness of our systems uh, of our corporate and 
uh, data systems, uh, which can happen over a period of time, is truly uh, quite uh, tremendous. Uh, I think we'll need a few things, though, uh, to really make that promise happen. One is that we will need uh, we'll need a regulator who would need to sort of look ahead, uh, who would need to kind of uh, start seeing the transformations that technology is bringing and can bring and can stay ahead of the curve and push the banking system in that direction rather than hold them back and rather than try and point out risks and rather than trying to you know, in some sense, say that only once it is proven elsewhere, then come and talk to me. That's not an approach that a leader can take. So we we, we need a different mindset, uh, uh, but I think there is work going on in that respect. Uh, so that is one. Uh, and the second is we will certainly need to make our technology far more inclusive. And I have a slightly different opinion on that compared to what uh, Shailesh mentioned. I agree that technology is a great leveler and it can it is a great connector but currently the technology that we have is dominated by the by the big techs and the big techs really at the end of the day they are making if you look at the top five tech companies uh, they are uh, either beyond one trillion dollars of market uh, cap uh, india whole gdp is two and a half three trillion and three and probably will reduce now so, uh, so they are making a lot of money and uh, it's it's not in their interest for, so we have to really in some sense create an inclusive technology. So when you talk about, when we talk about taking technology to the people, right, it's taking technology in Indian languages. Do Does everybody understand English in India? Basic, simple thing, right? Not really. I think uh, what numbers are like 10% maybe or 15% of the max. So that means one out of uh, seven, eight is... Uh, in some sense, how can we make uh, local language applications? And all of this is happening, but needs to really accelerate in a big way for us to uh, be called so-called the fintech leader because we are seeing currently videos. For example, we are seeing in many TikTok and other, uh, which by the way is also uh, going to become a financial player at some point of time if uh, regulations allow them. Uh, all of these guys are being seen more as a media players, but can they help make uh, uh, the world of finance easier. There is a regulatory angle, but there is also the angle of uh, uh, of inclusive innovation. I think subject to those two, uh, given that we have created the infrastructure, uh, the UPI, the, the MPCI, the uh, the GST, the other, uh, you know, there is a new framework called Sahai, which is being rolled out. Uh, there is a new framework on the digital health that is being rolled out. I think we have the uh, we have a unique opportunity, but uh, it's not uh, uh, by any stroke of imagination something that will definitely happen. You will have to make it happen, and all the people that you have on your course maybe can can play a role because it's really the India of tomorrow. Okay. Thank you so very much. I think you really had a point there. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Go, so, go. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, uh, Sanjay, I agree with you. And I think the regulator in India, especially Reserve Bank of India, because I've been working closely with RBI on and off for last 20, 22 years, understands the rent-seeking rent potential of technology. The way... India a leader in fintech in terms of access to people but in terms of building market cap from that will never happen okay a regulator will stop that regulator will not allow any kind of rent seeking any profit generated from technology will, will especially in fintech will not be allowed india is the second country in the world to issue open banking APIs. So RBI is thinking ahead of time. No other country has open banking API other than UK and India. But the way India has designed the open banking APIs is that rent seeking is not possible there. UK's API, uh, open banking APIs, you can seek rent from it. You, you can make a billion dollar company out of it. So that is the structural change, the structural mentality difference that we have is not technophobe.
Priya that we have in India, but we have this inclusiveness that is there in country, and we need to embrace that. That inclusiveness is something that we need to enjoy. Thank you. Unfortunately, Karan has stopped off. Thank you for your wonderful insights. Thank you. Just wait for another minute. You can see if there is any more questions, or else we'll wrap. So uh, I saw one question in the uh, comment section, chat section. Somebody had put a, a question about uh, geopolitics post COVID. so i don't know uh, i don't want to talk about politics in this forum i have views but i don't want to talk about it uh, so so yeah so i think there's no more uh, queries so yeah uh, thank you for your time uh, sanjay sir thank you so much thank you thank you thank you thanks yes excellent thank you